Thank you for joining us on Dying of Exposure. My name is Steve. I'm Greg. And we're watching Star Trek Picard. Uh, ev every week, we're going to watch Picard as it airs on CBS All Access. Uh, you can do a free trial to get CB All CBS All Access for one to two weeks. Uh, maybe even upwards of a month, depending on which site, coupon, slash spamware you decide to download on your phone. But what we're going to be doing is... Uh, watching the episode, and then kind of pausing it with our thoughts. So this isn't like a watch through with us. Um, so you'll see those hard cuts. Also, we don't want CBS and Paramount to take down all of our YouTube videos for stealing copyright. So enjoy this episode of Star Trek Picard, where we're going to talk about what we like, what we don't like, probably break it down into like three to five best worst moments kind of thing. You know, get that YouTube listicle money. And uh, yeah, let's get started. I don't want the game to end. All right, so that's the opening scene. It's the opening three minutes of the show. So I think this would be a good time to kind of chop it up. Uh, uh, Greg, how much of a Star Trek nerd do you want me to be to you during this episode? Oh, all the way. Uh, Blue Skies is the song Data sings at Riker and Troy's wedding in the last movie. Uh, the last right. scene of Next Generation, of course, ends with them with uh, Captain Picard joining the crew for the first time at the poker table. Right. Um, Got that reference. Poker table. Uh, uh, if you notice, they're on 10 forward of the Enterprise and Data's calling him Captain. You notice yep. that. So yep. you knew it's like this Straight has away. to be a flashback or a dream. It's something. Right. So you notice that. Here's what makes that great. If you looked at the uniform Data was wearing. That's from the Nemesis era of Star Trek uniforms. That is from the current, nice. the modern era, uh, or the last era. Kind of the, the, the Deep Space Nine influenced it. Um, Voyager influenced it, but um, but sort of like the 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 more of a jumpsuity with like a jacket and an under thing instead of the onesie that the singlet or the two pieces that they wore in next gen employees. He's not in a skirt. It's not a classic. It, it's not tra classic track. It's I, not. So, so serious question about that. Um, the game that Picard joins at the, in the final episode of next gen, that wasn't 10 forward. That was in somebody's. So quarters. yeah, that was in there. That was the normal. Okay. Normal crew core. That was not in 10 forward. Um, I assume it was Rikers. They, they yeah, don't make it, it real. Clear, they don't make but, it real clear. Okay. Um, and that's five card stud. Which they could have been playing. I uh, have um, no idea what they were playing. Uh, but that's why Blue Skies is the start of um, the series is be with a dream sequence with Data because Data sang Blue Skies. All right, I, I will withhold my criticism for the opening until we see the default opening, the for actual Picard, credits, and then I will reassert it because I'm confident that in all the ways this show might be great, and that the will opening. not be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for, for the viewers at home, I'm sorry, this is going to come off as pretentious. Uh, when I was a stunt man, I was invited to be, a, to, to help film next gen and early DS nine by Dennis Matalone, who was the stunt coordinator at the time. Um, and part of why I didn't do it was the, just the, they, they were, they were well-intentioned and they worked hard, but the fight scenes in next gen and DS nine were so wooden and so kind of what I consider to be half-assed. They good. weren't good. I'm not prepared for this John Wick, Wick shit in Picard. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, it's, it, it, really, it really is good. It's, it's one of the things that people get frustrated with with Discovery because of kind of how it's packaged. Yeah, well... Right? It is. And, and everything. But I wouldn't argue that the choreo in Discovery is ever the, like, the root problem of why there's so much... No, I would agree with that. Um, uh, uh, for that. But yeah. It's uh, a dis the the thing about discovery. It occupies an entirely separate part of my brain, mm -hmm. in much the same that Voyager and Enterprise occupy their own little corners. Yeah. The the continuity of, uh, original next gen DS nine is such a tight little package. Yeah, and then with Voyager separating themselves, right. Enterprise being a prequel, Discovery being a prequel, it doesn't feel like it's more of the continuous arc. Of the start main Star Trek universe, right? Even if it is, to be clear, we're we'll get into the discussion of Prime Kelvin. What should be considered Prime Star Star Trek later or never? Because it's not fucking oh, important. Oh, um, your way. I I heard between the lines. 
you're warning me that this is on the Kelvin timeline. No, it's not on the Kelvin timeline. Oh, uh, thank God. And there are a lot of people that don't consider any non-Roddenberry. They're so hardcore that it's original series and early next gen. And then in their mind, when Rick Berman sort of takes control of next gen in season two, I might add. Yeah, right. Um, uh, that that is that is not real Star Trek. And I'm like, you guys just got to. That's you a gotta, tough sell. Yeah, and, and, and everything. But no, Picard, no matter what you see on the internet, no matter how many people you argue uh, that, that want to argue with it, it is announced by the producers. Discovery and Picard are both prime timeline Star Trek oh, shows. Oh, good. Um, they, they, just... they intend them to be. And when they bring up things that didn't happen in the original series already or next gen, they're like, that's because not every show is going to have everything. It's And Star Trek has always retconned and sort of changed things things like how Klingons look or how Romulans look or what little facts when each new era of show come out and Discovery and Picard are the new era of Star Trek shows versus you know when next gen DS9 Voyager right. and Enterprise came right. out that was those were all super different from the original series and I remember people complaining to me in the early 90s when I was arguing with other little nerd kids like hearing their parents be like Star Trek Next Gen is garbage because it's nothing like original. That's where that whole Captain Kirk, Captain Picard thing came from. Well, kind was of. why do we have to compare these captains? It came from which kind of Star Trek do I like? Western style Star Trek or uh, philosophy diplomat style? Philosophy Western or philosophy diplomat style? Because those are the two different. And then now we're kind of going into uh, uh, shoot from the hip action style Star Trek, though. Not so much in Picard. You'll 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 see that. I feel like if you had the nerdiest meeting of the nerdiest fans, and you know, I I, I proudly count myself among that. That yeah. that is not a. I feel like if you were in that debate, that 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 you're you're everybody's sitting in a room and they're shouting at each other. The person who says, "Well, on um, Star Trek Discovery." It's just going to get shouted down by the rest of the room. Yep, uh, I, constantly. I, it's not terrible. I'm not. I'm not bagging on it, but it has very little to do with the the Star Trek we're talking about. Was, was, so we can get into it because have you? What are you current on it? No, I'm not current. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm about we it. we can get into it, and we will get into it, but not on this series. That, okay. Yeah. Well, there there we go. Let's look forward to Stephen Gregg argue about discovery uh, about discovery coming soon. Yeah. So the intro, what, what do you, what's your initial instinct on the intro of Star Trek Picard? I think that um, part of paying your dues to the things that paved the way for you um, is preserving a certain, like you got to be true to that. And in much the same way that, a Star Wars movie sort of needs to start with two ships, the undershot, the triangle, the crawl, right? The crawl. It's all been very well organized. Um, I think that you need a voiceover for a Star Trek show. I, I, I think it sets the pace. I think it helps you understand uh, what the philosophy of the show is. Um, that said, I thought enterprises intro, the progression through uh, yeah, video discovery, wise. not not the show discovery, but the the like here were mankind's yeah uh, journey of discovery. That was very very cool, and I totally got it. That said, I still wanted that kind of uh, original series next gen vo. Yeah, so it's really um, original series and next gen that set that tone. Deep Space Nine doesn't have that. Mm -mm. Um, I don't know just those I two. Uh, yeah, and Voyager doesn't. Nope. So I feel like. That's holding on to two things that Star Trek long ago decided to walk away from. Uh, I think they w made safer steps, like with D Deep Space Nine, which is a boring intro. Great song. Terrible intro. Terrible. Because it's just constant pans around the space station. Um, uh, uh, that's, uh, and then Voyager is just a different next gen. Um, Enterprise, at least videography-wise, I think really took a shot. I think Discovery does it, too, with their like schematic charts. Yeah. Um, of theirs. And then I think videography wise and musically, 
But I would have liked because this was Picard. I think I agree with you. Because this was Picard, maybe not even necessarily a space to find, you know, they're not on the Enterprise, right? So you, you don't give the Enterprise mission. Um, uh, but maybe just, uh, and this would be stealing from something as basic as Criminal Minds, maybe just have him give you a Shakespeare quote. There at the you, beginning uh, sure. of the, and then rotate that out toward that, the end of the oh, intro, that'd be amazing. and then that would feel very much in the same vein because, like, the intro's video is very much about inner space, like smaller things. Yeah, and I feel like this show, video wise, is going to go there, or at least that's what I get from the trailer and from what I know. Patrick Stewart would be interested in acting, um, but uh, uh but yeah, a Shakespeare quote or something like that. They just sort of, and not the same one. Mix it, it's a web series. Literally, give have it start at the same time, be about the same length, but literally give it a different Shakespeare quote each time, and it would be reminiscent without being exactly the same. And I think the audience would really appreciate it since uh, Jean Luc Picard is such a William Shakespeare theme. Uh, yeah, that's that's a brilliant connection. That that would. Like submit thank, that to them. That that is thank you, Criminal smart. Minds, for that idea. Yeah. I will. Uh, I will also say that Criminal uh, Minds. While yeah. I completely embrace the path that Star Trek has, well, mostly embrace the path that Star Trek has gotten, has gone undergone, underwent, undergone. Um, the pretending like this is anything but a direct continuation of Next Gen. Yeah, is is silly. Yeah. If you think back to, uh, I can't remember the title of the episode, but the family episode, like coming home or something like that, where mm -hmm. Picard visits Chateau. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, Chateau Picard yeah. to mm -hmm. visit his brother, who they don't like. Um, who's a jackass. Who's a jackass. Yeah. And he never really wanted to work in the vineyards and everything. Uh, now, put him in a rural situation where he plays with the dog. He's out in the earth and everything. And then reflects that and think about how little other than right after food they would eat wa have to wash their everything on that thing's got to be as sterile as i am yeah completely um, i mean your your transporter buffer is going to weed out literally everything foreign mm -hmm. i mean that's part of its programming yeah. so yeah you have to wash your hands when you poop yeah yeah when you go to the bathroom much when it. you when when you eat food and then you're pretty much done on it uh people are rarely sick uh, and so is there a future of the enterprise in starfleet do we just wash our uh, hands less no i'm going on record they don't wash their hands before they eat it's only bathroom stuff because there's literally I was saying no after you eat because you've got food on oh because you got food on your yeah it's literally just to get the sticky off do, like, there's a good uh this is total ignorance i don't remember ever seeing a next gen episode where they eat with their hands and I know part of that is probably the logistics of filming a show. All right, is that Deep Space Nine or next year? So at one point, somebody eats some Klingon food that's like a bunch of like noodle worms. That's right. Riker and, does. And, and, when and he's like, yeah. uh, so yes, but that's not a normal food he would eat. No. Yeah, usually they're forks and knives. Yeah, that, that, that was when Riker becomes a, like an um, a exchange student. Yeah, yeah, an exchange with the, student. With the Klingons. Yeah. And he doesn't know that they're supposed to be served live. And that's yeah, like yeah. the whole. Yeah. And so, so interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. But uh, either way. Ah. Uh, Questionable yeah. sanitation. It does, however, let you know that Starfleet. they've been with him for at least 10 years. True. Wait, how do we know that? Because it says we've been reminding you to wash your hands oh, for yeah, the last for 10, 10 years. years. Yeah, okay. This is good, subtle script writing to give you kind of a subconscious context of certain plot pieces. I got to say, that's a totally deep cut. Somebody <laughs> has been... Walking around with that. If I ever get to write a Star Trek episode, I'm going to talk about washing their hands. Mm. Like that, that's been walking this around is, for years. This is why you tune into Dying of Exposure for the <laughs> hand sanitation aspects of the. Let's just... sponsored by Purell. <laughs> why did you really quit Starfleet? Because it was no longer Starfleet. I'm sorry. Because it was no longer Starfleet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Holy shit. All right. <laughs> a lot of information happens a lot in this of... interview. 
Okay, so are synthetics androids? Are we? Dead? Yeah, yeah, like like data, and and then there's other examples that have spotted around in the series, um, that aren't as advanced as data, but basically anything that's an AI synthetic life form that has self awareness and can um can like pursue its own desires. It's weird that they're leaning so hard into that because the way they're using the word synthetic makes me feel like it's a new race. Uh, so it's, it's a question that I've seen in some of the other conversations about this is that as far as we left off data lore before data's mom, uh, and, uh, and data's short lived daughter. Right. That's it. And that's, that's the, the soon androids were it, but, uh, I well, clearly that's not who we're talking about. Yeah. That's not who we're talking data about. Data didn't destroy uh, Mars. But then I thought. And I'm like, well, would the Borg that Lore corralled be considered synthetics? They're pretty much cyborg. They're pretty much androids at this point. I don't. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll play and on because so, this we we can't solve this problem. But this is a weird thing to lean in hard. Yeah. Operations officer on the Enterprise was synthetic. Did you ever lose faith in him? Never. Okay, for the so, record, oh wait, let me let me address yeah, this straight into it. the camera. Um, I know he's British. I don't care. There's more of us than you. We're taking him. He's now one of ours. Sir Patrick Stewart. What a national treasure. <laughs> Holy right. crap. Right? Nah. Mar- married an American, moved to Brooklyn. He's ours. I'm saying he's um, ours. Uh, We're sorry. Uh, you can have Johnny Depp. So that that wraps up the <laughs> interview the portion of that. So all right, we got we got a lot of uh, interview. We got a lot of interview. Um, I want to make sure you caught the the, the big things right. Uh, Utopia Planitia destroyed. Yep, that's a big thing. That's, that's where most thing. of the starships for the Federation, the bigger ones, were yep. built. Um, uh, Mars is on fire for. Can we can we just yeah. just because that's a really good point that yeah. the average viewer may not realize. Most of the time we see the Enterprise in a star dock. It's above Earth. But if you follow any of the larger extended universe yeah. stuff from Star Trek. Or just some offhanded comments that have been peppered through the series. Yeah, that is not, in fact, where the Federation holds most of their uh, their assets. Yeah, the Utopia Planitia is, is the, was the main Federation shipyard. Uh, on Mars, and it was put on Mars because Mars has barely any atmosphere, it has slightly less gravity, so it's easy to move in and off of it, and you could mine a bunch of Mars um, uh, for it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then then the atmosphere being on fire for, what's like, at least a decade. We know he's been with Ron yeah, for holy, a decade. We know he's shit. been retired for longer than that. Um, means that they probably also put it on Mars because it's probably very bad. To make stars, like it probably just wrecks an atmosphere to make things on the scale of starships. So they're just like, we're just going to put it on this unpopulated rock. So that, and then it doesn't hurt anybody. It's actually, and I don't want to, I don't want to go too far into left field on this one, but uh, I, if Star Trek has, through its extended universe, identified the terraforming process of Mars, I don't know about it. But when you're talking about a planet burning. You're talking about it consuming all of the atmosphere because it doesn't have indigenous plants on the other side of the planet to replenish those supplies. I mean, if 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 Earth had been colonized with just Australia after the wildfires we've just had over the last few months, the whole planet would be fucked. Yeah. And so, so that's that's a really interesting uh, approach to with the state of the universe. Yeah, that that kind of level of disaster is uh, event. Yeah. Um. And then um. Uh. All to destroy a rescue yard, which I'm sure it's like you said, it's real weird that they went like they're like we're gonna blame this, we're gonna set this plot about blaming synthetics, and you're like that's a weird plot that we haven't really had a lot of zero um, explanation for that. But I'm hoping that this series unpacks a lot of that. Yeah. Obviously, the um young girl that we see in the opening scene, um uh or in the opening op- or in in boston at the beginning of the episode mentions the daystrom institute daystrom institute and robotics go together and go together constantly through like all of star trek 
uh, uh, from the original series forward. Um, so this is a this is early to bring this up and and I have no like significant knowledge on it, but there is a rumor and a, an allegation that um, CBS had to truncate had to shorten all of these episodes dramatically, and there was a lot of splicing. So things that were we were supposed to learn over multiple episodes or a whole episode has just been smashed together. Um, something about the, I, I don't have the information, but something about the Amazon acquisition of the series as part of their, you know, because they're distributing it everywhere except America. Um, so it is entirely possible that there was a whole lot more uh, either in script or filmed on that subject that we're just, yeah, that we we're going to see. We're not getting, and we'll find out if it actually hurts the series or if you, you know, it's weird to be patient on a weekly show anymore, right? You know, yeah. we're so used to Netflix where it's like, man, if you want to find out, just watch the 10 episodes. But, uh, but I mean, Mandalorian demands patience from you from the word go. It's just the difference with Star Trek and Mandalorian is Star Trek can't come to you without the space. Well, right. Without, yeah. without the world around it. That's what we want to know. Picard's the first future series since 2002. Right. So we, we get to see what happened after Nemesis, which we have not been able to see since nemesis and so there was no chance they weren't going to do it but i'm always fine with them being like this thing happened we'll get to that yeah i i feel like though uh, you know 500 races in star trek and maybe synthetics are just ai and and it's a broader maybe we're talking about androids what whatever yeah. um they are approaching us with a very aggressive it was the synthetics uh, much yeah. much in the same voice, you would say it was the Klingons or it was the yeah, Romulans. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird I, that they brought this up. This this all being, and I would I hope that they focus on how sharply this rose amongst the Federation. Like yeah. like how it was like you know there was only data and lore, and then maybe at some point something got unlocked afterward, and they went you know friggin' balls to the wall on on creating you know artificial life. And then that got away from them, as we suspect it would get away from yeah. them. But again, that's all supposition. Um, what else did we learn? We learned uh, uh, that he left the Federation because the Federation pulled up on itself. We learned that the well, Federation... Well, they were willing to let civilians die. Yeah, yeah the really Starfleet, the Starfleet was specifically... Federation was like, we're not comfortable with helping out our former enemies. And instead of Starfleet being like Starfleet has been in the past... Um, where occasionally it steps out of the Federation and is like, this is the right thing to do anyway, so we're going to put some ships on it. Just was like, nope, you're right, pull up, fuck the Romulans, uh, fuck the Star Empire. And everyone talks about that being like, the Federation would never do that. It's the Star Empire. Like, if there's an empire they were going to abandon, uh, it's the Romulan Star Empire. Well, it, it's um, it's interesting. We And I, I hope this gets addressed in the show, but... And just kind of lo the logical progression of events. We're while we're not in the Kelvin timeline, we are mm -hmm. dealing with the events of the that the caused first, the Kelvin right? timeline. So we yeah. know that that the sun um, around Romulus or or in front of Romulus yeah. has has died. The Romulus homeworld, the Romul Romulus Romulus yeah. is done. So that also means that the Vulcan homeworld has been destroyed. No, so the Vulcan homeworld is destroyed as punishment. Because remember that happens to Spock after Nero goes back into the past. So, so are we saying that the Romulan sun exploded, but Nero didn't happen? So, so Nero and uh, to to I don't know how long it's been since you've seen the two thousand nine movie. Um, so Nero and Spock meet in the back of in the split time universe. So the vault. You could argue that the supernova of Romulus isn't what splits the Kelvin timeline. Nero, uh, Spock going back in time and Nero following him is what splits the timeline. So, uh, so Spock going back in time is what then causes Nero to blow up that planet in front of him back in the original Star Trek era. Um, they don't do that. Uh, okay. They don't do that at the time. So this never right. sees that's, that's... Vulcan explode. It only sees Romulus go supernova. Okay. Um, that, and, yeah, right. that's the Good. difference. Good. That's so, helpful. So, yeah. So in the prime timeline, because it happened 
at the beginning of the 2009 movie, Romulus goes supernova. Like, it happens in right. all timelines. Right. Or like, uh, for sp- splitting off from the prime timeline. Um, it's just, this is showing us how the Star Trek we watched would have tried to initially reach out. Yes. That, so, Federation does the right thing first. It's like, yeah, get the planets together, get an armada of ships, whatever we got to cobble together, let's do this. Even though they're one of our longest standing enemies. You know, we we turn the Klingons back and forth over time. Why not Romulans in a moment of crisis? This is the opportunity. Then a terrorist attack essentially happens right. and destroys that. And now it's like, well, do we flip out more ships? And they're like, this was already costly. Now there's this aesthetics thing to think. And again, calling the Federation like this always benevolent thing, that has never, ever, ever been true Sometimes the original series and next game frame it that way, but more than often there's always some counterfaction or different thing. Right. You can find memes online about them being like, How is the Federation bad? One of these people got in charge of it and shows all these characters of episodes across multiple series of power players in the Federation trying to turn it into a direction. Right. So it really well, isn't so I don't want to I don't want to turn this into a modern politics discussion. But I mean it is. The, yeah, right. Mm. The but the Federation and the UN share more than a, a passing resemblance, oh, yeah. right? So what we're saying in terms of I gotta I gotta kind of analyze Schrodinger's cat for a second. So in in this moment in time, Spock is gone. Yeah. And the the Kelvin timeline has split. But it doesn't matter to any of these people because nope. that's that's how time Romulus and, just, and yeah, physics yeah. works, right? Okay, so, but we don't know why the hell then the uh, Starfleet has decided to let these people burn. I don't think the the events of Nemesis adequately explain that. No, uh, the events of ne- I I think I think the um, explanation is so. The same Starfleet that allowed, that didn't lock down the situation between the Cardassians and the Bajorans very well, right? Is the Starfleet that does this, right? Right, and and that's the thing. It's just like if you look at that scenario, <laughs> you don't care about genocide. <laughs> if you look at that scenario, that Starfleet should have just been chewing Cardassians for lunch all the time. And yeah, the Cardassian Empire also a foe. Starfleet, not big about war, always diplomacy first. But there were plenty of examples of where they they, they step over the line. And uh, so that's Starfleet. The Starfleet that, um, that, uh, uh, the Starfleet that prime directives to the point of you can't intervene if they're not a warp drive species, even if you can do it subtly. To save their lives that that's been on and off about that over the canon that starfleet it's not so much that they're villainously ignoring romulans and the reporter kind of is like well, it's just romulan lives and gives patrick stewart the ability to say no lives in an emotional way right. that makes us all feel great about watching him on screen at all times um but uh 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 i think that's the difference is that People often forget because the characters on the show that we watched were overall pretty, you know, morally well compassed people. That even if there was a disagreement, it wouldn't be someone was just being a total monster and another person was being, you know, the right in the right or good. It was oftentimes arguments about what's the best path forward. So we apply that to Starfleet and to the Federation. But the show has kind of gently peppered in, or the shows over time have been like, "Eh, it's still a UN, it's still like essentially an Air Force and a Navy kind of wrapped into one for Starfleet. It's still like 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 a, a members club that you have to have a certain level of government agreement to go into. And whereas these things aren't necessarily bad on their own, it means that there's gates and there's decisions about what can be made. There's a game politics. I just had a horrifying realization yeah. in the first three series, yeah. um, TOS, Next Gen, 
DS9. DS9. Yeah. In every one of those, there is a a subject of massive expansion of an empire. Uh, Klingon, Cardassian, Romulan, Romulan. Yep. doesn't matter. But part of the crux is an aggressive expansion of an empire that is unbelievably abusive to civilians. Usually. So, but, but Starfleet doesn't care until Starfleet space is threatened. Yeah. So we are literally, I've, I guess I've just never thought about it before. Mm -hmm. We are part of a side that is uh, again, resembling the UN happy to let genocide matter as long as it's not inside our borders. Yeah. Like, yeah, we don't. Yeah. The whole DS9, the, like, there's negotiations, and we come in all UN right. style to talk about it. But, like, we don't put, we don't put, Starfleet is constantly shown as a non-combatant naval force, even though it has multiple combatant abilities, and more importantly, it has a number of races, Andorans, Vulcans, if you get down to where their ship mechanics are, uh, uh. Um, uh, I can't remember that one race. They, they look like Yetis. Um, it's very Chewbacca inspired, but a little I, bit more. I think gorilla. they're called Wookies. Yeah. Uh, uh, those that all have durable ships, and they, you know, if you get into the books and the comics, you get stories with that. Um, you're not following the ship that fights usually, or the thing that fights, and it's why they make a big deal out of the Defiant being right. the first Starfleet commission ships. But like they're showing here. They just went to the planets, and they're like, gather up your ships, and then a bunch of private ships came rolling in. Oh. But yeah, they don't care about slave girls. Uh, they don't care about no, the Ferengi. never, never. The Ferengi and how they treat that. And so... The these, largest slave trade in the universe, in the Star Trek universe, <laughs> the Ferengi, yeah. literally never mentioned, like, from in that, a in that proactive like, sense. No. And so, let's oh not God. paint the Federation as this magnanimous hero organization it just tends to have heroes in it. 15 minutes in, I've never been this depressed about Star Trek. Awesome. Awesome. Let's get into Picard. Picard. Giving, it, giving us all the feels. Do you know me? What? Do you know me? No. Woman walks up to you and says, hey, have you dreamt about me? Awkward start. Let's just be honest. Yeah. And then she admits to killing a whole bunch of people who yeah. are trying to abduct her. Yeah. And then she rolls back around to the, have you dreamt about me angle? I dream about you. <laughs> super, super weird. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty intense introduction. I, I feel like... A little I, more rush than Firefly. A little bit. <laughs> I feel like um, Picard should have enough paranoia to, to not just let random people walk into his vineyard. His vineyard. <laughs> well, I mean, he's on Earth, right? Like, nothing bad happens on Earth. I assume I I'm just making guesses here, um. But nothing Man. bad happens on Earth. There's no need. There's no there's no lack of material need on Earth anymore. So they've defined that. So there's no homeless. There's no nothing because they don't have money because they have replicators. So you can just make everything you need. Nobody goes hungry. Everybody's got a place to live. You can work if you want to. You don't have to. There's no money. So um, uh, so they probably considerably less crime. I would hope. Um, and so, uh, I so less, but would, so, I would still be oh, afraid of this woman stabbing me in the heart. Again. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, just, yeah. As a man who's been stabbed in the heart, stabby, uh, stabby, uh, you'd think you'd be a bit more cautious, but you know, who knows? Who knows? Well, let's be honest. He did have a dream about her. We didn't get to see his dream about her. Maybe it was all happy, sexy time. Yeah. And it's, he, he could think that this so is a there, good thing. There's the, <laughs> oh, great. So? No, I think that I think the the novella or the novel of Star Trek that I want to read next is how frustrating it is. Like like Jean Luc produces one bottle of wine, somebody scans it with a replicator. Now you're just you're just fucked out of your wine. So there's there's always been an implication that replicator food isn't as good as regular food. Um, Cisco's dad owned a restaurant, right? Um, uh, and and that all had real food, right? And people went there because it had real food. Yeah, but how much of that um, is just the novelty of it? And 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 they referenced that synthahol and stuff like that is not nearly as good as alcohols. I I'm so I'm just saying you could go. To yeah. your replicator, 
ask and be like, for give a me whopper. a chateau. No, I, like give me a whopper and put three human pubic hairs in it, and then it's exactly the same experience as going to Burger King. It, it, it is, it is. Uh, but you can be like Chateau Picard twenty eighty nine. Uh, or 2289. Any and vintage he has on file. It's a shitty life. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. Yep. Cooks are the great oppressed mass of, of, uh, of the modern Star Trek. It's tragic. Oh, good. The wig's back. God damn it. It's, that it's, wig is terrible. It, it, it's really just them not. It's funny because I think what they're like, oh, it's fake hair, right? He's an android. So they're like, we're just, you know, and it, it's not Brent Spiner. Fake, said, right. We're going to make it look fake. But they used Brent Spiner's real hair. In the thing, so I feel like it just needed just a step or two into some blending along the top, especially the top line of the hairline, just to give it a bit more of a natural feel, because it can feel android, like we could have accepted it, but the fact that it's so clearly just like not a hairline in any way, shape, or form. I'm looking at a screen that the actor is wearing contacts, literally designed to make him not look human. And his skin is shiny and waxy, and the hair is the, the thing hair that's is most the alien. Thing that jumps out at you. I'm just saying that is that is not not good makeup. All right. Sorry that you have forgotten who you are. I don't remember that episode well enough. Did Picard develop a, a relationship with the daughter? What, with what's Dana's her name? Lol. Lol. No, no. yeah, yeah. Um. Uh. No. Uh. Picard didn't really super develop a relationship with her. Uh, but like every episode, he was a bouncing pad for moral advice on it. Um, uh, but like a uh, significant um, uh, piece of it, and what we can kind of obviously state, and you brought up the Picard banner and the thing, and one of the things I kind of hate about Star Trek fans, hate you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 one of the things I hate about Star Trek fans is like, People are like, Picard never connected with Picard Day. He was real upset about it. He didn't think it was necessary. And then in the seventh season, they do the Picard Day thing and everything. And they hold a banner. And he has sort of like a dignified, sort of grumpily, okay, I'll go along with it. It has been 20 plus years. Oh, yeah. And his life is significantly not what it was. Right. Which means that, yes, Picard cares about Picard Day. The things that... That that didn't matter as as enough. Um, another commentary brought up that Picard wasn't super connected, like super relationship with Data, like Jordy or like uh, Beverly Crusher. And it's like, well, he kept his arms distance, but again, Data died. He's the bridge crew to member to save Jean Luc to, to save Jean Luc after years of service. Yes, Tasha Dr died. Um, uh, shortly after they became a crew. But Data was there for over 10, 15 years on that yeah. bridge crew. That's the kind of thing where it's good, the, the fact that he's going to feel responsible for that loss. I'm going to say, for the record, that if, if Data presented Picard with a copy of a painting, they said one of two, mm. a copy of a painting of his daughter, mm. there is a 100% chance that Data also gifted Picard with a painting of naked Tasha Yar. Oh, hundo, hundo In some chance. completely inappropriate stand. Hundo. And like Picard doesn't want to have to explain it, so he just graciously accepts it, Yep, slides it behind that's, the furniture. That's that's in the archive somewhere. Yeah, completely. That's in the storage unit. Um, but yeah, and so so uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of split on how sentimental Patrick or, or, or Jean-Luc Picard is in this. <sighs> And it's like they forgot the episode Inner Light even existed. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, uh, he never wore it on his sleeve. I'm going to say. But su- he has a deep emotional connection to things that he doesn't like talking about. Yeah, and that's fair. And 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 I hope the conflict of his emotional state with the, the original crew becomes a central factor. Knowing how many of them are making cameos, I'm, I'm going to assume yeah. that's an issue. I got to say, for the record, because I'm on, we're on random tangents at this point, the fact that Picard does not hug Riker at the end of Nemesis, they leave it on a handshake, has pissed me off for 20 years. For the record. Yeah, I don't think that Unacceptable. that's... Unacceptable. I don't think that that... I think that was a 
fictional idea of the kind of person Picard is, not who the kind of person he was through the show or Patrick Stewart portrayed him as. That that was I, the, I, yeah, that was sort of like someone being like, "Well, Picard's a bit stoic." And that so was the a handshake. That was the movie that he wrote the complaint letter about, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it was also. Right. I don't think that one was directed by Frank either. No, no. It was just. It was just shit. Okay. I don't know how. That is not true, sir. How much does it say about a culture that hates androids that people don't know who the fuck Commander Data is? Oh, so much. Right. Like. Like he's the first hyper intelligent android in Starfleet. He does all of these things. He dies in the line of duty. Yeah. Anyone else, if 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 Captain Picard is famous, his whole bridge crew is famous. And so the idea that there's like who's Commander Data means years of downplaying the good one that was the first one. Yeah. To get them to hate the the bad bad synthetics yeah. it's a subtle play and i don't know if it's super deliberate or maybe they're just playing the dosh doesn't does happens to not know who he is but like she knows who patrick she knew who patrick or, or, or jean-luc picard was she's like you're captain picard yeah like yeah she knew him deeper but she also knew him mechanically um or like knew him by just casual knowledge right and yeah. he you know so there you go I'll go go the extra step and uh, and also say that uh, holy shit he he I think he starts as lieutenant data he dies as commander data mm-hmm. that is a long service life with very little promotion yep all right <laughs> okay what uh, they're not xenomorphs what who spits acid. Uh, so they don't do a very good job of it, but on rewatch of this, you hear him, you see him bite down on a capsule uh, and then spit it. And okay. so they do a piss poor job there. I can't remember the Romulans that, cause it's like, it, it implies that they are potentially Romulan. They got the point of the ear when, uh, Jean-Luc Picard looks at one with the revealed helmet that she's already knocked out. Um, and so, uh, there is a Romulan genetically modified force. Uh, I can't remember its name, but it exists in the Star Trek canon. Okay. And, and so people think that maybe that force, they just have the ability to choose to spit acid. And then, um, and then in, in fact, if you, if you pause the scene or if you rewatch the scene and you look for it, you can see his jaw like, like tense and then shift like he just cracked open something in his teeth. Nice. And then he spits something out at her knowing that he's going to die too. And it also hit the gun, which was degrading the gun, sure. which is what happened. Sure, that's what exploded. With, yeah, and so that's that's the whole thing. Everyone's like, Romulans, uh, I guess Romulans spit acids? Like, before you get all presumptive about how truly bad writing could be, <laughs> make sure you know it's that bad. Because, yes, if they suddenly made Romulans spit acid, that would be weird. It's but you're right, you know, like the weird little morphy creatures. Here. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on record also, completely unrelated. I think her stunt double is one of the uh, moneymaker sisters. Uh, we'll uh, find out if I'm uh, right. Yeah, yeah, right. So the other interesting thing, so she explodes, right? And I think from the trailers and from everything, you see it and you're like, oh, here's Star Trek Picard taking on Firefly's Summer Glow right. thing, right? So you see these things and you're like, oh, they're just going to do the mystery girl but she's super powerful no they kill her in the first episode um yeah Uh, yeah they blow her right up wow so like this isn't going to go like you think it will luke skywalker um uh uh it's not going to to be just oh there's this magical fight girl um that grandpa picard has to protect i i will say 34 minutes in they have now killed two people that they they're acting like i should care and I know. honestly aside from this this very uh like scared girl saying i dreamt about you yeah picard 
and then dying. I, there's no reason for me to give a shit about anybody. Yeah, other than other than Picard. Well, of course. Just, Honestly, his two his two uh, uh, Romulan aides have already. They're sold, very like, interesting. They're yeah, yeah. They've done a great job of scripting the backstory between the mm. between the three of them. A star went supernova. <laughs> So just to be clear, the Romulans have, uh, they're they're still in the process of rebuilding their home world, which sent most of their popular core population as refugees. But they've come up with all this new tech for new uh, so, warbirds. So Romulus, right? The Romulus Sun, right? When supernova, right? The Star Empire is nearly the size of the Federation. Sure. So that meant that, and and when they talk about it, they're like nine hundred ninety million. Uh, lives uh, is okay. in the interview they mentioned it's over 900 million okay. uh, lives that need to be saved well those 9 million lives or th- that that couldn't have been the population of the Romulus Empire no no so obviously it's not. taken some thought but it seems like Romulus was the, the, the empire was evacuating Romulans but recognized that they were just literally not going to be able to get it done in time so they're like, we just, the math will not work. We do not have the materials. So they reach out to the only other empire near or organization, federation near them that could help them on that kind of a scale. And it was the federation. So, whereas, yes, a blow to the home world, like if you were to up and lift the entire East Coast out of the U.S., it would destroy the U.S. for a while. But it wouldn't kill the idea of the United States. It would just mean that we just wouldn't have the East Coast anymore. So, so we're we're now uh, forty one minutes into Picard. The Romulans have reestablished themselves as being terrible. And look at me, look at me. If you cosplay as a Romulan, you're terrible too. Yeah, that's true. All right. Oh the Romulans shit! Had a hold of a fork. <laughs> What a great reveal! Holy crap! Okay. Yeah, so that got you right at the end, right? That is, you're like, Romulans, dangerous, classic Star Trek villains, but this is a show about Picard. And if you're talking about the villains of the next gen, you've got to be mentioning some Borg. Um, Wow. uh, So, so, uh, a couple things I wanted to make sure you caught. Maximum Star Trek nerd. Yeah. Do you remember who Bruce Maddox is? The no. person that recruited her to the Daystrom Institute that they can't find right now? No. Uh, I believe it's season two of Star Trek. I think it's called Measure of a Man, where Data goes on trial because somebody wants to oh, yeah. him. Oh, yeah. yeah that's right. Bruce Maddox. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so it's a, that's a great tie. Okay, in my good. Where it's just like, oh, and he mentions... We didn't get him, so we're trying to build him. Yeah, why not? Yeah. why? Right. And, and, and now we're talking about almost 25 years of time to get that done. So it begins to put into a concept of it's like, oh yeah, there was a passionate organization or guy who was head of the Daystrom or one of the lead scientists at the Daystrom Institute that was real big into AI and synthetics. And they totally gave it to us in Next Gen just as an episode. Yeah. Kinda, a good episode. One of the best episodes oh, of the fan, second season. It's fantastic. That um, trial is, is it, uh, awesome. Riker has to go on the offense. Yeah. Oh. And, and thinks that the world is going to hate him for doing it. Yep. Uh, so then, I mean, let's just, let's just complete the circle that we're talking about. He doesn't get Data. He gets Data's brother. Uh, Maybe. No, we, we know. Oh, that's right. We don't. We, we don't, don't know. know. He got B four right. at least. That, that's, um. So he had B four for meant, at least like the right. last several years. So he gets B four. They start creating copies, clones, inspired by whatever, and those are the critters that go loose and destroy Mars. Maybe. Maybe. Uh. Also, she, no. She says she knows. She says that they all of them from were here. from this lab. Right. But she didn't talk about a living tissue. Ver- I guess. I guess if they were just basing them as like more physical android robot you know like like non-living tissue off of b4's neural net right um well uh, but she straight up says the 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 androids the synthetics that were from their destroy mars yeah come out of that lab so that jackass can't get data as a test subject so he uses before and it goes horribly wrong fantastic 
Ah, what a great way to end it. Yeah, uh, and right. and and begin to answer at least again. It's a little weird that they go so hard on the synthetics, but begin to be like, okay, so they really wanted to package this Data Picard story, uh, and and tie it really tightly together. So they're they're looping everything they can to make it all of a piece to begin with, and then I assume because we saw the Borg cube that they're going to touch on a bunch of the Borg stuff. And probably just sort of live in a space, at least for this first se- season, of synthetic life and what is life, which they've sure. done on the on the various Star Treks multiple times. But it it hits harder with next gen because you not only have data there the whole time, um, and and lore and whether he wanted emotions or didn't want emotions right. and and everything. But you also had uh the P- Picard Borg like storyline, Lakita Borg arc, and and all of that. The Hugh line with them making a yep. Borg member. Yep. Um, the lore line and how he behaved as an AI versus Data. Right. Um, uh, you have Data trying to make his own daughter. So it's like none of these themes are actually... It, it's like once you have it in front of you, you're like, no, this is a story that they could absolutely uh, pursue how it unfolded. And uh, they never did. I, I got to say the only thing that's frustrating me at this moment is we now know that the the half of the twins that is searching for search for Picard blew up because they were murdering is is with the Romulans. That's a like I hope they explain that relatively. Yeah, quickly. I hope they do too. Um, um, I hope that they uh, um got which I assume they will. That actress yeah, yeah. is main cast right. in the series. Right. Um, and so as is the broken puppy she meets, and so so I assume there'll be many scenes with them. But I think. What I'm really interested about is I think that this show did, as opposed to Discovery's pilot, did a good job at sort of giving you pieces of the world, but not trying to explain everything all the time. And really the first half of this pilot episode is at a very kind of casual pace by comparison, because most of it's set in the vineyard, there's the dream sequences, yeah. there's the talking... It's trying to give you what Picard's life, I think, has become, which is a very slow, low intensity. And even when something high intensity comes in, how does he answer it? Blankets, he gets right. some rest. He doesn't jump on the I've problem. murdered a bunch of people. Don't worry, we'll have tea. Yeah, what he do doesn't mean? jump on the problem. And, and then he goes and he goes to like kind of look and discover it. And while he's distracted and everything, he finds out that she leaves. And arguably, it could be said, him not jumping on the problem might be why Dosh died, right? If he had, sure. if he had brought her to the Daystrom Institute the moment she came in and, and he connected her, or, or just, just immediately gone to Starfleet. But he didn't jump on it. He didn't act like Jean-Luc Picard, who was like, oh, is it business time? Well, this is all I give a shit about now. Um, and so there's an argument. And then, of course, his statement about his anger with that. And he's like, I'm not living. I'm waiting to die. Like, he's like, I'm not the man that I was. It really locks it in for the audience that's bad at reading visual cues and Patrick Stewart's emotions. Then he's like, I've been hiding here. Yeah. Mad that that things didn't work out the way I wanted them to. There's there's so many questions to ask about uh, his, his level of immediate acceptance. He, because he spots her as what she is, almost immediately. Yeah, I mean, in the first thirty seconds. Yeah, he's figured it out. Yeah, and he's just like, "Hey, go to bed. We'll have some tea. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it." They're not even really watching her. Um, and now we're understanding, in the broader sense, what the the androids are representing. Holy crap! Yeah, like it's. It's a significant, it's a very inspiring play um, to get you curious about episode two and the rest of yeah. the season. Because you're like, there's a lot of ways they can go. And it's a little rushed as a plot, but it's I like definitely within, rushed within sustainability of a plot rushing. It's uh, of yeah. a pilot. It's not, it's not discovery everything that should have been an entire season slammed into an hour and a half. Right. Right. It's, it's more like this could, this could have been a two part episode to get the story. Cause then we could have bonded with Dosh more. I understand from a, um, 
from like a showrunner portion, they made the very mechanical decision of it's like, well, she's just gonna play this other character. Let's right. Yeah, but like, like from a storytelling, you want more bonding, I think, in um in, in, of a character, that, yeah, that... so that you can line up with John Luc Picard's fury that he got to watch her die. But there's also an argument to be made for a man who's been hiding. Even if he wasn't that attached to her, he'd a feel like it was a failure because Jean Luc Picard would have never let that happen. Sure. On the Enterprise. Sure. And and b he's been hiding from probably all real significant emotion for. I mean, he already was bad at it, and then hiding from it for almost twenty years. Yeah. And so like like him being over a little overreacting isn't out of. I don't. I think it's more just to rush the pilot in. But it, 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 you could make a case for it. I, I think that um, my complaint about Picard at this point is that is that we have we've only seen a quarter to a half of Jean Luc Picard, and if they had not rushed the the storyline with her, uh, mm. let it develop more, let him assert his role as a protagonist, protagonist more. I think it would have been more interesting and we would feel more mm-hmm. connected to the Jean-Luc of old. Yes, he's despondent. Yes, he's um, given up in most of the ways that matter. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he's still Jean-Luc, right? Yeah. We, we need to have that kind of, um, that gripping. This man has commanded uh, fleets. Be- fleets, beings of all shapes and sizes and kinds in the highest of stress. Yes, that man breaks down over the despondent things that he's had to, to, to witness. But at the end of the day, you know, I want to see a little bit of the, if, for lack of a better word, a little bit of the Rambo in him. Like, th- there is still that point where he stops I, and goes, oh, wait, I'm still a badass. Yeah, and I think, I, I, I suspect, based off of sort of what we've seen in the trailers, where he's not going through Starfleet, he's getting right. a crew together. Right. I suspect that's where they're going. They, right. But again, a two-part pilot, even if that two-part pilot had literally just been whatever we're going to see in the second episode, and they're like, they edit it a little differently, give us yeah. a little bit more time, yeah, and then they're like, these two episodes might have sent it better. Um, I want to talk pointlessly, because I talk about this on pretty much everything we ever I ever put on Dying of Exposure, the music in Star Trek Picard oh, is fan goddamn tastic, in my opinion. It is melancholy when it needs to be. It is sad. It is unsettling. It is a throwback in the theme music, the the music of the trailer. Uh, they actually integrate a uh, piece of the inner light whistle blow thing at the beginning and the tail end. Love it of it just to give you a taste of him. Being that Picard, being in a different life, going on a journey to the theme of the show, which is his kind of current theme, and then, but then a little taste at the end is like, and he, and and part of his evolution journey is getting back a little bit of that old Picard. So that's great. The Romulans at the end, da, na, na, yeah, right. Na, na, that's their theme. Um, I was trying to remember: is there a classic Borg? theme there is a classic Borg thing and it is it. blended with that theme. okay good. um good. uh uh like there's a lot that um that they're doing score wise here to really drive home the emotions and when a show is super fast and high action a lot of that gets lost but on a show like this where there's talking scenes there's yeah, long conversations sure. that sort of strong heavy-handed music just really plays um yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go the extra step, knowing that from the trailers, we're, who we're going to get at least mm. partially through yeah. throughout. Um, deeply excited. I wish the, I wish it had given us a little bit more indication of how the the Borg reveal at the end is is so good, right? But <laughs> at the same time, absolutely no setup for it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's almost negative setup for well, it. Well, again, that's why I think maybe they're going to talk about the half step that Borg, like a for seven sure. of nine, is to 
the full android because sure. they do that in first contact right, right. like they, they they hit that hard in first there's contact. no question that the synthetics that destroyed mars are somehow connected through the tasha's clone or a twin and and the the borg we know all of that's going to come come to pass it would be neat if there was at least a little bit of a breadcrumb trail to i agree. follow um but i'm i enjoyed that that was a good 40 minutes of, of television. I'm excited to see the next episode. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's good. A little bit of a weird uh, trivia, because I like doing these um, at the end of videos uh, based off of what I've researched into my fandom for this. Uh, Brent Spiner only confirmed that he would come back if they left Data dead. Um, so it had <laughs> to happen that way. It had to happen that way. He was like, he had a good death. That was a good it death. It was a good death. And, 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 and... And and so the flashbacks were there. Um, number two, um, uh, uh, number two, and uh, uh, amusingly enough, um, it was the initial. So Patrick Stewart's been doing the press tour about this, right? Uh, uh, talking about these great writers, these award-winning uh, writers. That uh, there's a Pulitzer Award writer on the show, creator things, uh, came through. And came to him, so of course he had to take this meeting, even if it was just to say no. Right. And then they pitched him. Well, what's funny is, is that the actual story of it, which comes from the one of the executive producer, producers, I can't remember which one. I'll just pop it and text in this. But uh, um, one of the uh, 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 executive producers explains that the three out of four of them had gone to Patrick Stewart with some ideas, and he rejected all of them, not in the meeting just been like that so he came and he was all excited about this and then he found out patrick stewart wasn't really about it so he was like ah oh, that's that's sad but he couldn't get the ideas he had out of his head so he starts writing down some ideas of what he would envision a sequel series would be like for picard and he put that and then they sent that over to patrick stewart and that's what got the meeting now, what's hilarious about that, and the reason I bring it up, nothing in what he wrote down is in this show in specifics. Right. Just the feel. He's like, he's very clear. He's like, they're not using my plot. They're not using my, <laughs> my settings. They're not using that. We, we, we came up with different things. But it was the feel of what he gave him where Patrick Stewart was finally like, now this is a Picard I'd be interested in picking back up. Sure. So I, mean, I think I think there is a heavy influence, much like with number one being a Pipple, there's a heavy influence on, in a way that wasn't true of Next Gen or any other Star Trek. Right. This is more heavily influenced of it's like, all right, Sir Patrick, what do you what do you want this to be? Because uh, you agreed to come back. I I think he saw the the way the character evolves. He's he's losing control of his powers. Old man Logan is the only. Yeah. Oh <laughs> wait, know. sorry. Wrong. I know there's so it is many totally parallels. Like... And there are so many parallels, but that's that's what makes this good. It's uh, it's like you didn't expect it in a Star Trek sequel series for them to be like, we're going to give you not an enterprise we're not even going right. to start this in space um you're going to find out that even though you've missed some of it most of it nothing's happened for our protagonist he's just hit on this vineyard i have to say there is a rolling back to the 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 old man picard for lack of a better um concept something that that was really interesting from if you think about the character's evolution across his entire lifetime was Picard taking cover during the rooftop fight. Um, when she shoves him behind whatever that, that, that terrain feature is that she shoves him behind. He's like, yep, I'm getting my ass down. Yeah. And we have to remember from Picard's standpoint, this is the man who got stabbed in the heart during a bar fight who slowly had to learn what it is to be a captain, what it is to not go on away missions, that sort of evolution of self. And he's now in his 90s. Right. at the at, Clearly at the end of his conceptual life, uh, at least as far as the character is thinking yeah. of it. And he's like, yep, I'm just going to get my ass down. Yeah. 
He has nothing to contribute to that fight. He's not armed. He's 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 far too old to be physically uh, intimidating yeah. and and effective. I think that's a brilliant evolution of the character and really requires a moment of thought. It's definitely going to change the. I think what's funny is the series is going to go in such a direction that's so similar to Next Gen and yet not in the way that I feel like Picard, once the whole cast is kind of together, is definitely going to be you know, by default the mentor, the right. like the the, right. the 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 wise you know the wise uh, advisor and everything like that, and he's still going to be the protagonist, but I feel like they're gonna they're gonna really kind of flesh that out in a in a bigger way which is what star trek the next gen was but star trek the next gen was that show in 1988 i'm not going to count the first season 88 89 as it became where it'd be like the show's about different crew members sometimes it's specifically about picard but about it but picard's always there to be like the guidance as needed and uh like the kind of push and i feel like they're going to take that all the way with Star Trek Picard to be like, yeah, like he's going to be the drive. He's going to probably be the moral compass. He's going to be the person that is doing the right thing regardless and f- help find out whatever the hell's happening. But he's going to do all this with the actions of his crew right. in that growth. And it's exciting because it's real. Like, it, yeah, obviously Patrick Stewart's only 80, not 96 or something. But he's 80, right? Like, he's 80. He's in great shape. He's old. Shape. He's not ancient, yeah. is what we're saying. Yeah. He's in great shape for 80. But, like, he's 80. He's not going to get in fist fights. Picard didn't even like getting in fist fights uh, as he finally evolved to the fact that he could command, outsmart, and diplomat his way through most right. things. Like, it's unnecessary. Like,. So he's he's 80, right? And 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 so by taking advantage of that rather than railing against it. Yeah. It means that you get a better show. Um you get a better show than you would if they'd cast if they did another prequel series or this was about a different captain that could get into the punchies. Get into the punches. Uh, yeah. Not I, that I hate that, but I don't have a great way to explain this, but the Picard that we have feels, and, and maybe it's, it's the Borg tie-in and I'm feeling sentimental. The Picard that we have reminds me very much of the Picard at the end of the, the first Borg episode. Q has banished the, the Enterprise to yeah. whatever system the Borg are operating mm-hmm. in. And then Picard has to basically grovel yeah. to get the Enterprise saved and sent back to space. And he knows not only does he have to sacrifice his pride to save his crew, but that even then, even after sacrificing his pride, humanity is is doomed in a way because the Borg are going to be making their way this direction now that they know we exist. That that sort of, of sentience, melancholy, and and resolve feels very much like this first episode. I, I don't know yeah, if that it, it, I, I think it I think it does. I think it captured a very specific to next gen to Patrick Stewart delivery of a lot of the emotions that a lot of the captains would share right. at times. And then was like that, that is our root. And then we grow from there. And mm. that's exciting. Even though there are still problems, you know, they're imperfect things. Data looks ridiculous. You know, um, they jump around a lot. Uh, uh, but, that's exciting, and it makes a. That's a good pilot. That's what a good pilot yeah, yeah, yeah. does. Is it yeah. makes you want to watch the next episode. It makes you curious about where a show is going to go. Uh, this is overlapping with pilot trees and a lot, but yeah. um, but, I have a lot of snark that I want to throw out. Yeah, but I totally want to watch the next episode. I know, right? Yeah. Um, right, and, and that's the thing. So, uh, thank you for joining us on Dying of Exposure for the uh, Star Trek Picard. Watch throughs with a hard, hard per, for Picard. Hard. That's what we're. It's going to be called. That. It's going to be called hard for Picard. Uh, I uh, want this vote. 
share, comment, hard like, for subscribe, card for Picard, hashtag hard for Picard. <laughs> hashtag, um, oh my god! Uh, Gre- uh, 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 Greg, thank you for joining joining me on this series um, as we journey through the newest Star Trek and, and and the Star Trek that defined at least me. I think you too. Kind of like the the the, the oh the, next the, gen the, 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 the rock solid yeah. foundation. As familiar as we are with the original series, as many of those reruns I've seen, no. and as much as I'm doing an animated series on Dying of Exposure, um, Next Gen is like the Star Trek that we were raised on. So Completely. it's super exciting. Uh, so yeah, like, subscribe, follow us at Dying of Exposure on all social media platforms, and uh, make sure to hit up our other Star Trek content, Highly Illogical, a watch through of the Star Trek animated series. That has been both canon and not canon and back to canon again um, uh, in its history. And uh, enjoy these as they come out. And then enjoy our arguments about Star Trek Discovery when that comes out. And uh, every hundred likes, we lose an article of clothing so as the don't... series progresses. So just keep liking, subscribe. <laughs> we'll get naked. It'll be awesome. YouTube will love it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. Also, uh, I'll read my slash fiction. Uh, uh, <laughs> are we gonna end it on slash fiction? We're gonna end I think it on, we're slash gonna end it on slash fiction. Okay.